Grant Walker. Uh, I'm here at University of California, Irvine, and just received my PhD uh, working with Gregory Hickok. And uh, prior to my time here at UCI, I was uh, working in Philadelphia uh, with the Moss Rehab Group. And I've been looking at uh, picture naming responses uh, from people with aphasia and trying to understand the processes that are, are underlying that, that task. So, um, I will be talking to you today about a cognitive psychometric model for an assessment of picture naming errors and responses. We've got a lot to cover, so we'll start with theories of work production. What do we know already? Um, we'll talk about people with aphasia. This is going to be our population of interest. The picture naming task is going to be our measuring instrument. We've got picture, different kinds of picture naming responses. Um, so what does a large sample of measurement data look like? We'll just take a look at some of this data. Uh, we'll talk about psychometrics and cognitive models. You know, what are the latent processes that are involved in generating this kind of data? Uh, we'll talk about then fitting data, once, once we have established what we think is going on, underlying a, a picture naming attempt, we'll ask what are the most likely processes that generated our data sample, and do our assumptions lead to reasonable predictions about picture naming responses. Then we're going to look at some validation for our model. Is there a relationship between the test item difficulties and lexical properties? We will look if there is a relationship between participant abilities and other behavioral test scores. And we'll look if there is a relationship between participant abilities and stroke volume and location. Uh, you can use this model. Uh, we'll talk about how to use this model online. And, uh, you know, of course, we'll end with a summary. That's the short version of this stuff. Okay, so let's dive in with theories of word production. This is a description of the picture naming task that comes from Archie Hillis's 2007 paper in neurology. Um, and as you can see, uh, the task starts by viewing some sort of picture uh, out in the world. There's some sort of iconic thing out there. And we use our eyes and our primary visual cortex and things like that to obtain a structural description of this thing out in the world. And then we can access a modal general knowledge about this thing. We know things about it that the cowboys ride them, and they have saddles, and they eat hay, and they're animals. Um, and then we know some more specific lexical defining features. Uh, so it has uh, hooves, and it gallops. And there are some defining features, like a mane, which would distinguish it from something like a deer, which is non-domesticated, right? That's a, another defining feature for a deer. And then we have this word level. Um, somehow, we, we know that whether we say uh, the word deer, uh, so excuse me, horse, there's a, an error right there. So whether we say the word horse, or whether we read the word horse, or write the word horse, we know we're talking about the same word. We know that there's this noun that corresponds to these features. So there's this mapping that goes on between the word level and the form of the word. So whether we say it with our mouth or write it with our hand, we have to come up with some sort of code. And then, of course, in picture naming, the goal is to say it. So once we come up with the code, you know, this phonological code that corresponds to this word, which corresponds to this image, um, then we just say horse. Okay? So that's a nice, you know, relatively complete description of, of the picture naming task. Uh, here's another description. This comes from Gregory Hickok's uh, Computational Neuroanatomy and Speech Production. And as you can see, this uh, focuses on slightly different aspects of the task. So the conceptual system is just a, considered an abstract system. We know, we know about objects in the world. And we have a word level system. Excuse me. We have a word level system. And there's some mapping between our concepts and our words. And then the details of the model focus on this phonological level um, in, in the brain and, uh, of course, in the vocal tract, right? We have auditory representations and motor representations and somatosensory representations, and these things are acting uh, in, in these loops to control a physical vocal tract, right? And all of, all of these different types of representations are acting in concert 
to, to represent what we think of as phonemes and syllables in the form of a word. And here's a third model that abstracts even, even further. Um, so this is for Feugel and Dell's 2000 model uh, for models of impaired lexical access and speech production. And we can see, again, the, co the conceptual level is represented as a set of features, just abstract, arbitrary features. And there's a word level um, that can, so this is the, a, an example network for the word cat. Um, at the word level, this word cat has neighbors. So there are neighbors that have meaning similar to them. Dog, right? So we share some semantic features. And rat, which share, also shares some semantic features. And there's also this phonological level, and there are neighbors like rat and gnat, which share some of these phonological representations, and then there's some totally unrelated things like fog and log. And so the, the model here, this is actually a model of speech errors, um, and the model posits that there are these two levels where things can go wrong. You can choose the wrong word, or you can choose the wrong sounds of the word. Okay, so, so here are three different models of or theories of word production and sort of the takeaway point here is that choosing a word to produce and actually producing the sounds of that word depend on separable processes okay and these processes are studied at, at varying levels of abstraction okay so we know a little bit now about what is the task that that we're going to be talking about so what about people with aphasia well uh, these are folks who have had a stroke, a left hemisphere stroke. So on the left here, you have a picture of a healthy right hemisphere brain. If you look at a top-down view, you can see that there is a very large piece that is missing, that, that tissue has died from, um, due to a cerebrovascular accident. And uh, there's about a million people living with aphasia in the United States today, according to the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke. So this is a, a, a problem that affects a lot of people. And when people try to speak, their speech goes off target. A lot of times they're not able to say anything at all, but if they are able to say something, if they're, uh, you know, we have these uh, really heroic research participants who will come in and, and name pictures and try to name things, and, they, and it goes off target. Um, and word finding problems are the most commonly reported symptom um, across the, the various uh, types. So, we looked at a lot of people with aphasia. Um, the first group of folks that we looked at come from Philadelphia. And uh, there's a large database that is online. You can access this data. It's at the MAPPD.org. Um, all these folks are at least one month post-stroke. Uh, most of them are at least six months post-stroke. And this is sort of a, a measure of their general aphasia severity. This is the distribution structure of general aphasia severity. We looked at a second group of individuals with aphasia um, coming from a totally different research hospital in a different part of the country in Columbia, South Carolina. And these folks were all six plus months post-stroke. And we had 90 individuals. So, so these are very large groups of, of individuals with aphasia compared to your typical studies of, of this population. Um, and you can see uh, that these groups are different. By the way, this WAB AQ, the Western Aphasia Battery, is a general score of aphasia that includes these four subscores: so fluency, comprehension, repetition, and naming. So that's that distribution that you're seeing here. So, so it's important to remember that that this sample, right? We want to look at people with aphasia generally. What we are actually looking at are people with aphasia who agree to participate in research. Okay, so that's. That's not exactly the, a, the complete sample, right? So if folks have other difficulties going on, right, the more severe uh, individuals may, may not be interested in participating in research. You may notice um, that there is this difference in, in the sort of overall severity in the patients. Very few people from Philadelphia, the Philadelphia group, have an aphasia quotient less than 50, and almost half the group from Columbia have a score less than 50. What I think is going on here is that the Columbia group offers treatment during their recruitment process. So when they approach somebody in the hospital and ask them to participate in research, they're, they're told, uh, we, we hope you get better by participating in our research. We're going to offer you some therapy. Uh, whereas in the Philadelphia group, they're told, we don't expect you to get better at all from participating. Um, but it's just for science, so we hope you'll help. In any case, we, we're trying to sample from this 
uh, population we, that we think is the same. We don't think that there's anything fundamentally different about how strokes impact language um, in these two groups. So um, what we're going to do is combine them. What I will show you also is that this WAB aphasia, uh, sorry, the Western aphasia battery provides a diagnosis type. So it's not just severity. We, we can see that there's also differences in the types of aphasia that are present in these two groups. In both cases, the anomic, anomia type, having difficulty with word finding is, as I mentioned, is the most common symptom, and that is also sort of the most general type of aphasia that you see in this in both cohorts. Uh, the Columbia group had more Broca's aphasias, uh, uh, Broca aphasia, excuse me, Broca's aphasia patients, and also more global aphasia. Uh, whereas the Philadelphia group had a little bit more conduction and Wernicke's type. So in any case, we're going to combine these groups to try to just get a large set of data here. And so you can see um, we have a pretty good coverage uh, skewing to the, you know, to, to the high end uh, for this general aphasia severity. And we have quite a few uh, individuals from each of these different types. Not so much from transportable or global, but nice large samples here. Okay, so what we're going to look at is picture naming in particular. The, the Western aphasia battery looks at something general and it has a small picture naming test, but we are going to look at a more detailed picture naming test of, of, that was developed specifically for research in, in stroke patients. So it's called the Philadelphia Naming Test. Again, this is available online for free. Um, and it, it has 175 pictures of common nouns, so it's, it's quite a few pictures, um, much more than you would see in a, in a normal clinical test. In, in, the Boston naming test goes up to as many as 60, but generally uh, we, you aim to give fewer than that. Um, there's high name agreement among healthy individuals uh, who, who, have, um, who have performed this test. And all the items are presented in a fixed randomized order, so, so everybody sees the same items, but they're not in any order of difficult to, to hard or, any, or easy to difficult or anything like that. They're just random, but everybody sees them in the same order, the same number of items. And so the responses that we categorize, if you show this picture to somebody with aphasia, they just make look at you and say, I have no idea what that is, uh, or shrug, or not say anything. So we'll call that no attempt. They might get it right. They might say, they might say cat. Um, they might get the meaning of it right, right? So they can say dog. And if they get the sounds right, they, they might say something like hat, which doesn't really share meaning, but it shares the sounds. Maybe they'll get both, rat. Um, that sound and meaning, or maybe they'll get neither the sound nor the meaning, and they say something like jug. Maybe they don't even say a word at all, but they get the sounds right. So cats would be a neologism, or you call that a neologism, and if they're just totally, they don't get the meaning or the sound, if they say flirt, something like that, right, that we're going we're gonna to call that an abstruse neologism. So there's eight. A so a tiger would be a <coughs> semantic here. So um, it, it does share a single phoneme, but so our, our Criteria is, is pretty uh, weak for sharing a phonological uh, similarity. If they share the initial phoneme or the final phoneme or two phonemes in any position, um, then that, that will count as phonological similarity. So cat and tiger share, uh, the, the question was, was what, is, what about tiger? So that, that would be a semantic response because they have that T in common, but they're in different places, um, but, a, but they're, uh, they're related by type, taxonomy. Uh, also, if a litter box would be semantic as well, because those things co-occur in the world. So, what does a large sample of measurement data look like? Well, we want to know, do, are, do items elicit different responses, and do participants produce different responses? So, analyses of variants indicate significantly different response rates for items and participants. Um, and so we illustrate this with these 95% confidence intervals for each item and participant response rate. And these are sorted and plotted. So the blue items, uh, the, are the, the median rate is colored blue in each of these graphs. So the median item here, uh, the, the median rate, I'm sorry, these axes are very small and hard to read, but that's about 60%. The median correct response for participants was about 60%. But uh, we can see that there are a group of participants here colored in red who are significantly above the median. They, they produced a lot of correct responses, and there were folks significantly below the median. They produced a very few correct responses. And so participants produce different levels of correct responses. That's exactly what we would expect. 
Um, and we also see this for the items, right? There are items that elicit high rates of correct responses, and there are items that elicit low rates of correct responses. These are very difficult items. Okay, so that's something to note here, um, is that we have these differences among participants of items. Another thing to note is that the most common responses are correct responses, no attempt, right, uh, or neologism. So these are where you, where you get most of your variance in the data set overall for both items and participants. Um, something that's perhaps a little bit subtle that, that might not jump out or, or we might um, realize just at first but from, by looking at this data, there are participants who make you know, significantly more than zero semantic responses and mixed responses, but generally a, a, an individual participant, their, their response rates for semi, producing semantic rates, uh, producing semantic errors and mixed errors are fairly rare, but there are items that do elicit, that have a strong tendency to elicit semantic errors and mixed errors. So we might be able to use this to our advantage to gain some sensitivity um, about the ability you know, in, in the abilities involved in making these semantic and mixed responses. Okay, so, so this is just showing you what that data looks like. You know, that's when we look at it by participants or we look at it by items. Okay, so what are the latent processes that are, are involved in generating this kind of data? Well, we're going to take a moment to talk about psychometrics. So this is a, an old tradition in, in psychology, relatively old. Um, as far as psychology goes. Uh, so a mental ability can be quantified as a probability of successful processing. So this is a way that we can put math onto mental abilities. You can put numbers onto mental abilities. So item response theory assumes that this probability of success uh, is, depends on an interaction of participant ability and item difficulty. So these, these ideas were um, are largely attributed to Lord and, and some other statisticians working at the Educational Testing Society. So if you have taken the GRE or the SAT, the GMAT, or, or these other standardized tests, right, they use this mathematical formalization to so that not everybody sees the same items and you can make creative, uh, sorry, computer adaptive tests so that uh, so that people don't see different items. You can zero in and you get more, more precision, measurement precision on the ends of your, of your measurement scale. So this is one model that allows us to separate these participant abilities and item difficulties. This is the Roche model. It's um, mathematically identical to the one parameter logistic model from item response theory. And the way this works is, uh, so the probability of a successful attempt um, depends on the ability and the difficulty, and it's the difference between these. So if these are exactly equal, this term becomes zero, e to the zero is one, and one plus one is two, so this becomes one half. So if your ability is exactly equal to your difficulty, then you have a 50-50 chance for naming this item, or for producing a correct response on, on some item. And if your ability is greater than that difficulty, you have a higher than 50-50% chance, and if your ability is lower, then you have less than a 50-50. And this ability, these abilities and difficulties are measured in uh, units called logits. They're a lot like a z-score. Um, so they, they go from negative infinity to positive infinity, um, and they cluster uh, around zero. Um, but typically a measure, a test measures a single latent trait, like math ability. When you take your SATs, you get a math ability score, you get an English ability score. Um, but picture naming is a complex process. Uh, and we can learn more about why errors occur by examining the types of errors that occur. By the way, that's not unique to picture naming errors. Math is also a complex process of so statistics problems and things. If you're grading, you, you know, there are steps involved, and so you might come up with a rubric to assign partial credit. And that's kind of what we're doing here. So let's turn to our cognitive model. What, what do we think are the steps that are involved in, in producing this, uh, a picture naming attempt? So a multi omeal processing tree illustrates the latent decisions that must be made to arrive at different response types. Um, these multi omeal processing trees have been popular in psychological assessment, um, particularly in memory disorders and things like that. 
and they are easy to, to start using, um, building and use these things. There's a, a handy program called Multitree, um, where you can build trees with a graphical interface and it will spit out equations for you. So, so let's turn to our tree and the responses that we are trying to explain. So we have correct responses, as you can see here on the far right, that's the, the response that we're trying to produce on any given naming attempt. But we might deviate from, from our path to correct responses, so we might produce a, a semantic response, we might produce a formal response, a mixed response, unrelated, uh, neologism, which is a non-word, or totally unrelated abstruse neologism. And of course, we might just make no attempt. Okay, so those were the response types that we're trying to explain, and the way we get to these response types is through this tree. So there are two levels of representation that have to be processed, lexical and phonological. So first, a word has to be selected, and then the sounds of the word have to be retrieved and produced. So each branch in our tree is associated with a probability. Uh, remember, that's how we, we uh, assess the successful processing. Um, and the likelihood of each response type on a given naming attempt can be calculated by multiplying the branches leading from the root node to the leaf node of interest. So that's what these equations look like. They might look kind of scary, but it's actually quite straightforward. This just means that the probability of a correct response is equal to, we start with the root node, it's A times B times C times D times E times F. That's it. And that's the probability of a correct response. So this is um, a nice product form for each of these. Um, so what are these, what are these probabilities? Well, there's five probabilities that govern lexical processing. Maybe, arguably five, maybe just four. But So this first one is the only um, probability that, that leads to a single response type. All the other, uh, all the other probabilities um, depend on multiple response types. So there's this probability that we make an attempt. Um, there's also the probability of identifying the correct semantic neighborhood of the picture, right? And we assume that this is, depends only on the participant. These are these are very clear pictures. We know what these are. So they're, they're, it's not that different items should elicit unrelated responses at, at, at different rates, right? If something's going wrong, it's it's a problem with the person. Um, next, assuming that you can recognize what the picture is, you have to retrieve these defining features, right? You have to recognize it's a horse and not a deer, so we have the probability of retrieving the correct lexical semantic information. And then we have the probability of retrieving correct lexical phonological information, right? You, there are words that sound like the word you're trying to say that, you, that will come to mind when you try to name the picture. And in the healthy system, um, when we try to name a picture, the normal thing to do is to, is to bring a set of candidate words to mind, right, that are both semantically and phonologically related to the target, and we have to choose the best word. Okay, so that's the, the last step of lexical processing is this choosing the correct uh, target lexeme over a set of competitors. Okay, so then there's the, to, for phonological processing, regardless of which word we pick, we gotta then retrieve the correct phoneme. So this is the probability of retrieving a correct phoneme. If we make a phoneme error and we change one of the phonemes in the, in the word that we're trying to say, it might still result in a real word. Okay, so that's this, this next probability here. The probability that phoneme change in the target word creates a real word. So this is assuming if, if the person produces some of the phonemes in the target word, we're assuming that they were able to access the phonological neighborhood of the target word such that, you know, a, a the probability is when it uh, creating a new word is going to depend on that target word. If we don't know what target word they're actually trying to say, if they choose some word that is you know, semantically related or unrelated to the target, but is totally unrelated phonologically to the target, it's as if they're grabbing a word from the language at random. So um, this is going to be a global parameter. It doesn't matter uh, which item or which person is, is naming this, um, there's always some probability that if you grab a random word from the English language and you change a, a random phoneme, that it will result in another word. Okay, so these are the eight probabilities that are going to be involved in any given naming attempt. So what then are the like, most likely processes to have generated our data sample? So we're going to talk about fitting data, and I'm going to gloss over this briefly, um, the details of how we actually do this, but the goal here is to find the MPT parameters that maximize the likelihood of these 63,875 naming responses. So we just have a long list 
63,875 numbers, you know, one through eight, it's just a list of digits, one through eight. That's our data that we're, that we're trying to, to fit. And what we're going to do, we're going to use Gibbs sampling of the posterior distributions for each parameter given the data. We use a program called JAGS. Um, the, um, this is the part where I'm going to gloss over. There's, there's some very good uh, work here. I would recommend the Lee and Wagenmaker's course, Basing Cognitive Modeling, um, for an introduction to, to, to how this works. Um, but suffice it to say, hopefully for now, that it, once you have the equations that I showed you and the data and some reasonable prior assumptions, you can plug this in and it will tell you sort of what the most likely parameters are for, for a given set of data. So uh, there were six parameters that apply to each item, and there was 175 items. There were six parameters, right, each parameter is a probability in our model. Uh, six parameters that apply to each patient. There were 365 patients, and then there's that one global parameter that applies to English generally. Okay, so these 3,241 parameters were able to regenerate the data with 67.7% accuracy. What I'm showing here um, are the posterior means, this is the distribution of posterior means in the sample. So this is just to show you that, that in our data sample, we estimated, right, there, there are people who have different um, abilities for making an attempt, different abilities for rec recognizing semantic features, different abilities for uh, lexical selection, different phonological abilities, and we also see a spread of item difficulties as well, right? We, we find, given our data, that some items are harder than others, right? And so what we've done is we've taken this very long list of numbers and we've shortened it to a much short, shorter list of numbers, 3,241 um, numbers, and then we try to regenerate this list. And when we do that, we, we get 67.7% of that correct. So remember, there's eight possible outcomes. If we were just randomly guessing, we'd have a 12 and a half percent chance of being correct. Okay, so we're doing better than just random. Our, our model is definitely capturing something about this data. But how good is 67.7%? It's a D plus. But what, what about, uh, you know, how do we, how do we interpret the 67.7% accuracy? How hard is it really to guess? You know, if you look at this data and then you just close your eyes and, and write down a, a small list of numbers, how hard is it to then regenerate this data? So to get a sense of that, we compare the MPT model against other purely statistical pattern recognition models. So the uniform random model, again, this is we're just guessing numbers one through eight. We guess 63,875 numbers one through eight. Um, another way we might try to guess these numbers, right? We look at we look at the data and we write down for each person what was the most common response that they made. This is the optimal guessing strategy if uh, you don't have item level data available. You say, well, okay, most of the responses were correct, so I'm just going to guess correct for every item. Okay? That only requires 365 numbers. Remember the multinomial processing tree is using 3,241 numbers. That doesn't seem like a really fair comparison. So with these extra parameters, what we can do is uh, we use pairs of parameters where we take one and we say, okay, uh, which we, we use a single parameter to identify a deviating response from the mode. So we say, okay, you named most of your items correct, but not, not number item uh, 37, you made a semantic error. So we'll use one parameter to note that 37 was different than your normal thing, and we'll use a second parameter to say what that, that actual response was. Okay, so we use these extra parameters to correct deviating responses. So again, we're just looking at the data, trying to pull out some statistical information and then, and then regenerate the data. So here's another way that we can do this. This is a, a neural network, um, and this is sort of a bread and butter, very simple, uh, using a lot of the defaults um, from MATLAB's pattern recognition network. So it's a feed-forward network, and we have 10 of these, um, which are randomly initialized with different weights. and they, we use backpropagation, we show them these models of the data, and they use backpropagation to find weights that um, do a, a, as good a job as they can at mapping from different items and participants to these response rates. So, so each uh, participant is represented with a vector of zeros and a one representing the participant, and again, uh, items are represented with a vector of zeros and a one representing the item. Each of these feeds into its own hidden layer, um, and then these two hidden layers feed into a third hidden layer to combine these, these pools of units, and then they feed into a, an output layer. Um, 
And so these will, will identify sort of local minima of, of prediction error. And finally, we have just the full data set. You just write down all the numbers. Of course, you can then copy them over and have perfect prediction. So the, the, we provide that as sort of the boundary, boundary model. OK, so here are the results. And let me go through this table. So we have here on the left are, are the different types of models. We've got the random model. We've got our 10 neural networks with different weights. Um, this is just guessing the most common one, the common one plus some error correction and our MPT model and the full. There's the number of parameters in each model, so just guessing randomly, you don't need to write down anything. The number of parameters in the neural networks are the number of weights in the model. There's just, a, you know, it depends on the number of units in the model. Um, there's 365 modes, right, and then we use the extra parameters so that the modal plus correction have the exact same number of parameters as the MPT model. And of course, the 63,875 numbers from the full set data set. So the predictions here, this is the proportion of times out of these 63,000 um, that the model predicted this type of response. So, so you would guess this type correct 12 and a half times. And you would guess semantic errors 12 and a half times if you're just randomly guessing. And you would expect you to be correct 12 and a half percent of the time. So that's sort of a floor uh, for comparison. So something interesting about these neural networks, uh, three of them found the mode for the entire data set, which is um, correct. They predicted 100% correct. They just said aphasia doesn't exist, or if it does, let's not worry about the errors. And if you just predict correct on every item, it turns out you will be right more than you're wrong. 55.8% of the time, you'll be right. Um, of course, this doesn't tell us anything about aphasia or what's going on. And in fact, none of these neural networks felt that it was statistically worthwhile to even try to predict any of these other error types, semantic, formal, mix, unrelated, right? And we know that these occur in, in the population, but just from a statistical standpoint, the, you know, the variance in the data set is sitting mostly in the correct responses, the non-word responses, and these uh, omissions, the, the no responses, okay? But happily, the MPT model, um, first of all, had the highest uh, prediction accuracy, so so this was was um, actually a little bit surprising to see, but but you know that's satisfying. And also, it predicted each type of response. Um, mixed errors were were predicted so infrequently that they were rounded off in the table, but it did occasionally predict predict that somebody would make a mixed error on some item. So the takeaway here is that our processing assumptions are leading to predictions that are at least as good as pattern recognition models. So, so we're not, you know, our, our assumptions are not making these wildly inaccurate predictions. So we're feeling pretty good about that. Okay, well, what about things beyond picture naming? We've talked a lot about picture naming, but obviously there's a lot of stuff going on other than picture naming in, uh, in aphasia. So we can ask, you know, these black box models, these statistical models that we were looking at, they use, they find whatever parameters are good for picture naming. Right? But they, they don't mean anything outside of that context. What's cool about this psychological cognitive uh, model is that these parameters mean something. So the item difficulties, we can sort the items and we can say, you know, how are different items, you know, are different items easy or difficult and in different types of ways. So for it, so I've just shown that the top five and bottom five uh, items here and, and for these different types of difficulty. So I, I thought this was great. Uh, so, so Gary Dell has been using this item cat as the quintessential uh, prototypical item um, in, in a lexical network. And it turns out that in this very large set of aphasic data, that is the number one item that people will try to, to name. If you show them a picture of a cat and you want to get a naming response, that's the picture you should show them. So that's kind of interesting. So, but people will also try and say things like book and pen and key and shoe. These are very common things that we can recognize. And they are a lot more cautious about making an attempt on words like dinosaur, cheerleader, stethoscope, microscope, and garage. Those don't really roll, roll off the tongue. Those are kind of hard, right? These are much um, sort of weird, weirder words. We don't encounter them so often. So what about the lexical semantic details? This is interesting. So these are items that are highly recognizable. They have these critical features, right? So a pen has that little thing that you click. Um, this is a ballpoint pen. Uh, the, the balloon, right? It's very, it's very easy to draw a picture of a balloon. Very recognizable. A well, right? So there's 
you know, a picture of a well, a book, a typewriter. Um, these are all artifacts, by the way, like human-made objects, very um, spe have specific uses. Things that are harder to recognize, a bowl, a glass, right, people will say cup. Um, slippers, people will say sandals or shoes. A wig, right, people will say hair, a van, a car, automobile, truck, something like that. Uh, so these are words that are easy, once you recognize what it is, these are easy to retrieve the phonological form, right? Sometimes you know exactly what it is, but you just can't quite get the word, right? You get, you're getting interference from other words. These words are resilient to that interference. Eye, dog, ear, baby, apple, those just pop right into your mind. When you look at a picture of a rake, for some reason that word does not come to mind quickly. Crutches, broom, when you look at these pictures, those words are not really coming to mind quickly and you get interference from similar sound. You know what the word is, but you get interference from similar sounding words. Um, so lexical selection, these are, these are words that are, again, easy to, easy to say. They come to mind very quickly. I, beg, he, hand, tree. Uh, these are words that, again, have strong competitors. Celery, people will say lettuce. Helicopter, people say plane. Slippers, shoes, and, um, skull, skeleton. Plant, people will say flowers or leaf. Um, for phonology, so, so now we're getting into, so these were all based on word selection. So what about saying the word? What about actually producing the word? Man, cat, baby, dog, cow, right? Super easy to say, it rolls right off the tongue. Volcano thermometer, microscope, binocular, stethoscope, much harder to say, right? These are much harder words to say. Now, this last difficulty, this is actually just a probability. Remember, this is the probability that a single phoneme change, or a phoneme change results in another word, okay? And look at this, the, the, the two, uh, so these are easy. So easy in this case means that there's a high probability that changing a, pho a single phoneme results in another word. And look at that, iPod. Right, there's lots of words, like these first two actually satisfy that criteria. Um, there's lots of words that sound like iPi, right? Uh, nail, hat, man, there's lots of words that sound like that. Very unlikely if you change a phoneme in thermometer to get another word, or stethoscope, or ambulance, or octopus, or volcano. There's just not a lot of words that sound like those words. Very unique sounding words. Um, so if, that, if, if just looking at the top and bottom doesn't satisfy your statistical need for, for p-values or something. Um, when we can look at, at the lexical properties and the relationship between these difficulties and lexical properties. So the lexical frequency is the number of times that a word you know, appears in TV or, or uh, movie transcripts. Phonological length, the number of phonemes in a word. And the phonological density this is the number of words that differ by a single phoneme. Right? So of course we expect that to correlate very strongly with, with this probability here. So what we did was we used ascending stepwise linear regression to identify lexical properties that made a significant, unique contribution to item difficulties. So each row of this table here is, is a single linear model, right? And we ask which of these three predictors do we want to include in, in our model? Um, and we want to make sure that they, these have unique contributions to, to explaining the variance in a, in a linear fashion. Okay, and so the sign of that coefficient, if, if, if it was significant and we want to include this in the model, I, I just included the sign of that coefficient. Um, the magnitude gets a little bit difficult to interpret, but minus means that if uh, there is a higher lexical frequency, it makes it easier to say. And if there's um, uh, sort of a higher length, Right, there are more phonemes in a word, it makes it more difficult to say. So that makes sense. Um, the most, the strongest simple linear predictor is shaded. So if we just want to use one of these to, to predict this ability, um, we, would, we would use, for instance, lexical frequency to predict lexical semantic ability, uh, excuse me, lexical semantic difficulty or lexical phonological difficulty. Um, and then that's what is plotted here in these regression lines. These, these are just simple linear regressions with each of these individual uh, lexical properties predicting the difficulty of, of an item. Uh, and so, so you can see there's a range, but, but it, all of these correlations are, of course, significant, non-zero. Um, but they're more than just significant. They, there, there are clear trends here. They're, they're noisy, but there are clear trends. Um, so, so that's great, we, you know, these, these difficulties, these item difficulties that we are estimating from picture naming responses seem to uh, match up and, and um, you know, correlate with, with the 
lexical properties of the language, just like we would expect. Um, so let's, and then word T and word L, remember these are just the probabilities that depend purely on phonological similarity of words in the English language. So we're, we're estimating something about the English language by looking at these picture naming responses. So I think that's kind of cool. So the probability that a single legal phoneme change in addition to deletion or substitution in a real word creates another real word can be estimated with simulation. Right, so there's another way that we can get at this probability, right? We just randomly replace phonemes in real words, and we observe the proportion of how often a real word you know, comes out. Okay, so uh, Wendy Best looked, into, you know, tried to do this um, in 1996. She was um, she was using sets of items from picture naming studies in particular, um, and because she was she was interested, uh, I will point out. I just wanted to point out that the title of her paper is "When Rackets Are Baskets and Baskets Are Biscuits: Where Do the Words Come From?" A single case study of formal periphasic errors in aphasia. That's marvelous. So um, she found that in these in these studies, when you know with these words, um, you know if you just randomly change a phoneme in these words, right, you're getting um, proportions of a word outcome of 20% to 45% of the time. Um, so Gary Dell and and, and folks um, used uh, the Philadelphia naming test items specifically. So these are the items that, that we used in our test. And they found an average word proportion of 0.26. Now remember that they aren't considering item level stuff. So they're actually talking, they're using this as sort of an estimate of that um, global parameter that, uh, about the English language that I was talking about. But they're using a set of English words, right? Specifically the Philadelphia naming test items. Okay, so uh, they, another way that we can do, so they're using these specific test items. So what if we use the, what if we try and generate a comprehensive list of the entire English language? So I came up with a model lexicon that has 39,698 words. These are just common entries from the SIL English word list, the CMU pronunciation dictionary, and the subtle lexical frequency database. So a whole bunch of words, uh, you know, we try and make a comprehensive list, and we randomly draw words and randomly replace volumes from that set. Um, and we found an average word proportion of 0.21, ranging from 0.15 to 0.27. So this is, again, this is an estimate of you know where we expect that probability to be um, when we when we make our estimates. So what we found from actual naming responses, the MPT model estimates an average word proportion for the PNT items of 0.23. So that's I think remarkably close to the 0.26 value that that um, Dell and colleagues came up with. Um, interestingly, right? They don't. They weren't. They were just trying to estimate this mean value. What we can see with, with when we look at each of the items um, is that right. This is not a normal distribution. Most of the words we expect actually have a pretty low probability of, of creating a real word. But there's some of these you know words out here that just have an incredibly high probability of creating like I and pi, right? It's kind of interesting. We learned something new there, and this is again, this is that correlation between the phonological density, which is long transformed, but this is the the number of, of words that differ by one phoneme, and the probability for a particular word of, that a single phoneme will result in, in another word, as estimated by, from these errors. So that's pretty cool. And for the global probability, um, the MBT model estimated for for English as a whole, um, estimated that probability to be 0.15, ranging 0.12 to 0.18. So so this 0.15 is on the, the low end of what we estimated you know, with our word list, but overlapping intervals, right? There, it's in the ballpark. So you know, that's, that feels pretty good. So let's so okay, let, so we've learned about the English language by looking at picture naming responses. What about these individuals? Well, uh, Berman et al. used principal components analysis to investigate the covariance of 17 behavioral measures, including picture naming, um, the, the picture naming test that we used from 99 participants with aphasia. Um, principal components analysis is a purely data-driven um, approach where we're just asking how do these things co-vary? What is the what is the where, what is the covariance structure like in in this large set of tests? So here's the Philadelphia naming test. These are the factor loadings. They found four factors uh, accounted for a large proportion of their data. It's very typical of principal components analysis. You will always find a small number of factors that explains a large proportion of your data. It's a, it's a data reduction technique. That's how it works. Um, so what we found when we include, so that this test battery included the picture naming test. It also included a bunch of tests that um, deal with picture to word or picture to picture matching. Okay, so, so here you get a set of pictures and you're given a probe picture and you have to say which picture goes best with it. 
Um, perhaps you're given a set of pictures and given a word, and you're asked which picture goes best with that word. Or perhaps you're given three words, and two of them are synonyms, and you're asked which word doesn't go with these other two. Okay, so you're making decisions. You're getting a set of words or pictures, and you're making a decision about these. Um, they label this factor, that they go one step too far, and they label this semantic recognition. Uh, that, it's kind of a no-no, but what they, you know, they don't, this, is, this name doesn't really mean much um, beyond the observation that these things, co these tests co-vary with um, at least part of the Philadelphia naming test. There's also um, another set of tests, the Re Philadelphia repetition test, where you're just repeating the same items, or non-words, where you're repeating non-words, or immediate serial recall, where you get a list of words and you try and repeat those. So these are all production. You're, all, you're trying to say thing, you know, word and word-like things. And of course, that also um, co-varies with a portion of the Philadelphia dating test. Okay? So what we might ask is whether, so this is a fairly data-driven um, uh, observation. We, we note that there are these tests that co-vary with one portion, and there's these other tests that co-vary with another portion. So we might ask, what about our theoretical um, numbers that, that we derive, what about, what about our abilities? Do abilities actually predict these tests? Just by, you know, instead of looking at the whole data set and coming up with a number, can we just look at picture naming and come up with a number that also predicts these other tests? And the answer is yes. So again, we do um, ascending stepwise linear regression. So here, the uh, performance on synonymy triplets is best predicted by lexical selection ability as is performance on picture, the Peabody vocabulary test and the camels and cactus test. So the three tests here that we, that we looked at that are based on choosing from a set of words, right? that is explained by our lexical selection ability. Um, when you are trying to figure out the, which specific word, which picture goes with the specific word, the, the visual details come into play, right? the, the lexical uh, I'm sorry, just being able to recognize what that picture is comes into play. Okay? And then our production tests, the phonological ability, right? This is the ability to actually produce the word predicts uh, word repetition, non-word repetition. Interestingly, when you are producing words, the word level ability comes into play. When you are not producing words, the word level ability does not come into play. And when you are producing a list of words, it is the word level ability that decides whether these words interfere with one another. So this is, this is actually pretty great. And these are whopping correlations in, compared to what we normally see in aphasia research. So um, correlations around 0.7, um, right? You, you know, it's, it's not a question of, of significance here. It, it's a question of how, you know, how, how good is our pattern. Um, and, and it's pretty strong. And what we're seeing is that these abilities are providing stronger uh, linear correlations with these behavioral measures than any of the individual naming response types. Um, except for this immediate serial recall and correct responses. So if you can say correct, if you can name pictures correctly, that will predict it. If you can say a bunch of words in a row correctly. So, so this is great. We're, we're using all of these picture naming responses and we're, we're, we're using our knowledge of the picture naming task to come up with these abilities that predict stuff outside the picture naming. Just one test predicts all these other tests. So that's pretty cool. So what about um, stroke volume and location? So for the 90 participants from the C-STAR archive, we looked at these lesion maps. So these are maps to a common template. And um, so there's, there's a lot of noise involved here, right? Not everybody has the same brain organization. People's brains are a lot like people's bodies and other body parts. They come in all shapes and sizes. And they, they, they're not necessarily the same functional organization. But um, one thing that we can, we, we try to make these generalizations by, by looking at at a, a temp, you know, the, the, their damage mapped onto a template. We kind of ask about, you know, where are we, are, are we just sort of generally involved in, in these abilities? So we don't expect super strong relationships here, but we're really looking for significant relationships here. And I want to point out that there's a range of stroke volume here. Most of these people have um, stroke volume between 3 and 150 um, cubic centimeters, but there are some people who have some really big lesions. Um, okay, so if we overlap all these lesions, what uh, what we find, right, well, this is a generally true of, of aphasia, is you find damage around this parasylvian um, uh, fissure, which, which is where the language uh, cortex is, is thought to, to reside. And we can divide the, the brain up into these regions. Uh, I'll just point out that there are three regions in the superior temporal gyrus here, which we'll 
come into play. And there were 66 of these brain regions that were damaged in at least 10 participants. We want to make sure that if you know, a brain uh, damage is damaged in, in enough people to make it worthwhile of including it in a statistical model. So if it's only damaged in a few people and you include it in a statistical model, it's only going to speak to that small group of people. So, Again, we use ascending stepwise linear regression to identify brain regions where the amount of damage makes a significant unique contribution to abilities. We include total lesion volume as a potential predictor. Okay, so we want, you know, so if, if just the size of the lesion generally is better at predicting, you know, damage in a particular region, um, we, can, we can learn that, that from this analysis. And uh, a further caveat is that these predictors were only included in the model if all the coefficients remain negative. Um, that's a kind of a weird thing that can happen with multi multiple linear regression. When you add predictors, some of the other coefficients may become positive. But we want all we want to you know maintain the assumption that um, more damage in a region decreases the ability. Okay. So these are the brain regions that came out for for these different abilities. So uh, to so these are. Um, sagittal, uh, uh, lat, lat, a lateral view from the side, and this is looking head-on um, at the brain. So if we want to um, estimate uh, using brain damage in different regions what a person's probability of making an attempt on a given item might be, uh, we would want to look at this, oops, sorry, we would look, we'll look at the superior occipital gyrus, which is primary visual cortex, that's back here. We would look at the uh, retrolenticular internal capsule. This is white, a white matter tract that carries primary visual signals from the thalamus to primary visual cortex. And the superior, the anterior portion of the superior temporal gyrus. So this is uh, implicated in semantic processing. Okay? Uh, and again, this is the number one predictor. If we're just going to use one of these brain regions, um, the pole of the superior temporal gyrus is the number one predictor. Um, for totally unrelated responses, this is commonly known as Broca's area. This is the uh, inferior frontal gyrus, the pars triangularis, um, and the parahippocampal gyrus. Only a few, uh, 11 people had damage in the parahippocampal gyrus. This is um, a structure that is involved, it's a lateral temporal lobe, it's involved in memory. Um, facial, famous patient HM had, had damage there. So if you look at a picture and, and say something totally unrelated, right, damage to the parahippocampal gyrus is going to predict that, as well as damage to this frontal region. Um, interestingly, I think for the lexical semantic and lexical phonological where, where you've recognized the picture and you're trying to load the details of the word, they both depend on the middle portion of the superior temporal gyrus. Um, in semantics, this is supported by uh, the primary visual. Remember, these are you're f looking for defining features in a picture and trying to map that to a word. And here, this is supported by the cerebral peduncles. This might actually be, just be atrophy, and this is the main white matter tract in and out of the brain carrying uh, somatosensory and motor signals. Both of these are communicating, or, or uh, seem to be you know, dealing with this middle portion of the superior temporal gyrus when you're actually selecting the word the anterior and posterior portions, but not the middle, are coming into play. So still, the superior temporal gyrus um, appears to be you know, doing a lot of the work in terms of representing and selecting words. And then when we actually try to produce the word, the posterior insula, so this is cortex that's sort of tucked away in, on the inside of that in, uh, sylvian fissure, that appears to be involved. And that has been implicated in um, articulation and things like apraxia. It's involved with uh, voluntary breathing. So, you know, speech is a type of voluntary breathing. Um, and so we can see that there are these individual regions that are associated, and there are networks of regions that are associated. We can also see the strength of the association in each of these individual regions. Um, as I mentioned, these aren't super strong correlations, but they're there. They're, these are noisy, um, noisy results, but they're there. There, there clearly is a, a relationship between the amount of damage in these brain regions and um, the naming ability. So finally, how can I use this model while well, we're developing an online um, platform so researching clinicians can enter their item level data. So remember, you have eight different types of responses. You have 175 words. So you just plug plug these this data in and um, give it about six or seven seconds. Um, we have a Metropolis Hastings sampler that will obtain 
these estimates for you. So these ability estimates, so you'll get a, a summary of your data. Um, these ability estimates can be interpreted as the probability of successful processing on a PNT item of average difficulty. Um, so remember, these items are, are tend to be very easy. Um, all of these numbers have to be multiplied together to produce a correct response. So any sort of decrement in, in your ability, the probability of successful processing, right, is going to be noticeable in aphasia. Healthy people are going to be very close to 100 on all of these abilities. Um, but just to get a, a sense of, uh, to help interpret those values, um, we're going to provide percentile scores um, right now just from the 365 uh, patients, that's a, that's a relatively large cohort um, to compare yourself to, and we can ask what is the proportion of people who have lower abilities. And finally, we provide 95% credible intervals, which help gauge the precision of the model's estimates, um, as well as help to identify meaningful changes. So if you, if you estimate that there's some range of ability and then you obtain another measurement, you can see if it's still in that range. So, brief summary. Um, the theories of word production that we looked at posit at least two distinct processing levels, lexical and phonological. We analyzed 63,875 picture naming attempts from 365 people with aphasia at two research hospitals in different parts of the country. Uh, a multi processing tree can formalize the latent decisions that have to be made to arrive at different picture naming response types, so not just correct responses, we looked at the actual type of response. Um, this processing can be separated into participant ability and item difficulty components. Uh, the item difficulty components that we estimated uh, are consistent with lexical property measures. The estimated participant abilities are consistent with test scores and lesion size and location. Uh, and finally, we're going to make this uh, available for researchers and clinicians to, to use online. That, that you may notice the web address has not been provided uh, pending uh, peer review of the manuscript. But that will be maybe edited into this video uh, website here. <laughs> and this, of course, is an ongoing project. Um, as we collect more data, we uh, are aiming to improve and expand our measurements and interpretations. Um, so folks that are funding this, the National Institute of Health, the National Institute for Deafness and Communication Disorders, they are funding this, um, this whole project, the CSTAR, Center for the Study of Aphasia Recovery. Uh, the National Science Foundation, which uh, helped pay for my grad school. Uh, Dr. Gregory Hickok, who uh, was my uh, PhD advisor and uh, was involved in um, debating with me about the structure of this tree and, and how to, to draw it and, and how to analyze it and all kinds of stuff and, and just putting up with me generally. Um, so fo the folks at, at University of South Carolina who were involved with collecting uh, the behavioral data and the neuroimaging data, Dr. Joseph Richardson, Dr. Chris Gordon, and the folks in Philadelphia, uh, again, involved in collecting this data and, and getting it into my hands. Uh, Dr. Myrna Schwartz at Moss Rehab, um, Dr. Gary Dell, at the University of Illinois, Champaign Urbana, who um, behind a lot of the modeling and very encouraging, um, and Dr. Jan Merman also um, helps with a lot of the modeling and, and very encouraging in providing the data. He's now at the University of Alabama. And of course, this could not be done without all the speech language pathologists and research assistants who uh, you know have slaved away over this data, um, and, and of course, uh, most importantly, the research participants and caregivers, um, who are absolutely heroic, uh, as, I, as I think I mentioned, um, they, can, they come in and, and do these tests um, and, and let us study them, um, and so, of course, many thanks to them. Um, so, I, do we have any, I guess I'll open it up to questions from the room first, and then I, we also have questions online, I think, as well. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, I, I, asked, I, I think I accidentally uh, did away with your uh, slides uh, when I uh, put up my uh, webcam. Okay. If you want to run those back, that's fine. Uh, if you have questions from your home, could you please repeat the question? Because sometimes people online can't hear it. Okay. Uh, can you see the chat box as well? So that people have a question from outside? Yes, I can. Yes, I see the, the chat box. Excellent. Um, so, let, yeah, let me uh, add. Yes, so from the room. Well, uh, I've got a lot of, of comments about the talk. I thought it was really well put together. Thank you. Very clear. 
uh, and there were just a few places uh, that I may want to go over with you at another time. Yes. But I could ask two or three of them. I mean, the one thing I was a little confused of is this proportion correct or something that you were using was a 67 or so, something like oh, that. Oh, the prediction accuracy. Yeah, yeah, so I was thinking, suppose you had a model for flipping a coin, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a 50-50 flip, and you collected a bunch of flips from each a bunch of people, wouldn't you? You could never do better than 50 percent, could you? That's right. Um, that un unless you unless you know something about that coin. Right. So it's a 50-50 coin. Right. So, so right. what I'm saying is, is that. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Let me repeat the question. So the question was uh, about the, the are we made a model and it predicts um, responses with 67.7 percent accuracy? But what if we made a model of flipping a coin? And we asked a bunch of people to flip a coin, um, and then uh, and, and try and predict what, what their outcomes are. And the question is, w wouldn't we only be able to do as well as fifty percent? Even though that's the correct model. Even though that's the correct model, and and I would say that is that is absolutely true, um, unless you know something about that coin. So, for instance, if you brought in a two-headed coin. Right? You could do much better than 50%, you could predict at 100%. Or if you know that the coin is weighted, right, you could still do better than 50%. And so the idea is that in um, a person who is naming an item, um, it's not 100% it's not random. The idea is that we, we make some assumptions about how, you know, in the same way we can make an assumption about how a coin works, we can make some assumptions about how a, a random system like a brain works and try and do a little bit better than, than just random. Uh, let's see, oh, there's a question from online. So the question online, um, did lesion modeling allow two-tailed effects? Example, injury to brain region causes disinhibition and more attempts. No, um, no it did not. So, so the, the model that we used was a multiple linear regression, right? And we only, uh, we, we would add a term, so, so it was, it was two-tailed in, in um, I guess, in, in the, in the p-value that we used for determining whether to include a predictor in the model. Um, the effects themselves, we, we would only add a, a predictor to the model if its coefficient was negative and all the other coefficients remained negative. So, so we only entertained the possibility that more damage reduces ability. So, or, so, right, so, so more damage would reduce your probability of making an attempt. That, that, that's a good, good question. Um, and that's, that's just an, an assumption um, that, I, you know, I, that we've made that, that we think, that I think is reasonably, um, it's reasonable across the general aphasia population. We generally don't expect more damage to, to create more, more naming attempts. But, but it, it certainly could. Thanks. Yeah. So there, I, I can say that the um, the abilities, those correlations between ability, the abilities derived from the model, uh, from our uh, tree model, have stronger linear correlations with all of those behavioral tests um, than the S or the P weights. Um, are they significant? Are they significantly stronger? I don't, I don't know. I haven't actually tested that, um, but certainly just in terms of um, you know, if, if you just want to say, you know, which, you know, you, right, we've got these two, two models, two, two ways of taking data and coming up with some number to evaluate your ability. Um, the numbers that come from the, the tree model correlate better with, with these other behavioral tests. Um, so uh, other advantages are, you know, they, they, because, so the, the, um, the Dell S and P model doesn't take item item difficulty into account, so you lose measurement precision on the ends of 
uh, of your ability spectrum. So if, right, if, if we know that certain items are difficult, um, people who do really well, we can show them these difficult items and, and get sort of zero in a little bit better on, on their ability, whereas you know, people who are, who are very poor at naming, um, we can show them you know, these easier items to try and narrow in on, on where they are on that end of the spectrum. So, so that, that's an advantage, being able to take, uh, use item level data um, in, your, in your predictions will give you more precision on the ends of the spectrum. And I think I've gone some way, uh, hopefully, to convince people that um, these values are meaningful, right? They, they, you know, to to the extent that you know item difficulties make sense, right? The the participant abilities should should equally make sense. Um, the uh, you know so I, I think the, the S and the P weights, um, you know, can can be great as a quick maybe rule of thumb type, uh, you know, kind of a quick and dirty assessment. Um, but, but I think that you get more information with, with this type of model. So yeah. I've got a quick follow-up question. Uh, so, the PT is very long for clinical application. Yeah. It seems to me that we can use your data to make the test adaptive and then cut down the time a lot for it. Is there any comments on that? Yeah, so great idea. Um, Will Kula already had that idea a couple years ago. So there is already a, uh, he, he used some of the data um, from, from some of the previous work that we did. Um, so uh, I have a 2012 paper, I think, um, with PNT short forms, where, where we looked at test retest data, and we looked, uh, and I tried to um, come up with two sets of 30 PNT items that uh, different different items, but were matched on, on these different semantic and, and phonological properties and criteria um, to try try to create two two sets for pre and post test. Um, and so uh, Will Hula and and um, some of his colleagues. Have, have already done, used a bunch of this data and come up with a, a computer adaptive test. They, they did mo uh, modeling. Um, the, so they are only using correct responses, so just, ju uh, just accuracy. So they're not actually, so again, it's, it, they're using um, these, these item response theory ideas um, in the same way that the SAT does, right, where you get a single uh, picture naming ability. Just one. You just get a, a single number that, that tells you your picture naming ability. Whereas you know this tree model will tell you know breaks it down into these different components of picture naming, um, so so there's an advantage there. The uh, the you know one of the advantages with just using correct responses is that you can you can, so in order to do a computer adaptive test you have to score it online right every time they make a response you have to score it and decide what the next item is so that's very easy to do um, if you're a clinician and you're just watching somebody name pictures you can just say you know say yes no you know very easily and then and then the pro, you know, computer program can decide what the next item is it's um, you know all of our pnt scoring as you know is is done requires training and is done offline and and we listen to these things you know many times sometimes to, to get it uh, to make a decision about what they actually said but there is there is a computer adaptive Philadelphia naming test out there in the world. Um, last time I last time I looked at the manuscript, the software was not available yet. They were working with some software um, just to hammer out the details of that online scoring process. But but all the math um, and things had were worked out, so that's available. Any other questions, comments? Uh, does fatigue factor into uh, how many items are presented? So uh, you use the same order of items each time. Are you just getting more difficult items towards the end just because of fatigue? It's a good question. So I have not looked at it specifically in terms of um, sort of serial position and, and their effects on item difficulty, um, that, that, that's a great thing to look at. So what, I, what we have done is, is just looked at sort of a split half. Um, you take a lot of the data and you, and you just sort of look at the first, you know, first 50 items and the last 50 items. And they, uh, we don't see significant differences. Um, but, but, you know, of course, if you, if you say, you know, that's a, if you take enough, um, 
samples, eventually you will find a significant difference. But, but the point is the, the, the effect, the differences between the, the first half and the second half of the test um, seem to be minimal. Uh, when, we, when we administer it, it um, it's a lot of items. Um, so sometimes um, it, it has been administered over different, different days. So if, if people are really struggling and just seem to be petering out, you know, they'll move on to a, a different test and, and start up again on you know, the next item and do another set the next day. It's pretty rare. Um, usually, usually folks get through it and it's, um, and, and it's not too traumatizing. Um, but, but, but occasionally, yeah, we, we do split it up if, if folks seem to really be, you know, struggling. So we got another online question. Do we think we could do automatic scoring in a computer adaptive test? So do some automatic speech recognition to transcribe uh, what the participant and score what the participant named. So yeah, that's, you know, that's sort of like, uh, a, a dream goal I've had kicking around in, in, in the back of my head um, because right out of it would make, make my job obsolete, uh, just let a computer do, do all that, right? Um, I can go work on other things. Um, so, so um, it, it, the, the difficulty, the, so the automatic transcription stuff is um, getting better and better by the day. The, generally, they, they use model, they use a language model. So Siri and then and Cortana and things like that, right? They assume that you're trying to say real words, um, and that that helps their their prediction of, of what the sounds are that you're trying to say um, to you know interpret the, the speech waveform, and that sort of uh, we and, and it does a lot of work for these for these um, models for these speech recognition models, um, and we don't have that advantage because we don't we. You know, we don't know exactly what they're trying to say. We don't know that they're even trying to say a real word. Um, so we, so potentially, you know, I, um, you know, uh, I, I think it would be great. I would, uh, it's sort of, yeah, yeah, like I said, it's sort of one of those um, pie in the sky dreams that I, that I have. You know, maybe use the, like the video information and things like that. Um, uh, you know, so so do um, sort of mouth segmentation um, and and use the audio. Form, uh, waveform to sort of extract phonemes and, and, and do transcription and scoring and you know if we have a model lexicon that that certainly helps right that, that so we know what, what things are words and what aren't um, so that, that's one one step in the right direction but yeah my understanding the, the big the big um, bottleneck there is the is, is speech recognition and you know if you solve that you get millions of dollars for work for Facebook. <laughs> Grant, uh, yeah. could you say something about how uh, uh, potentially articulatory problems might interfere? Uh, how do you deal with that in practice? Yeah. Do you speak or dysarthria, how do you separate that from coding? Right, right. So we, we largely ignore it. So in you know in the way that I showed that more detailed model of, of speech production, the, the Greg Hickok, um, the state feed, hierarchical state feedback control, which which uh, you know gets into the details of, of different types of production errors, and you know is is the articulation coming from choosing the wrong sounds, or is it because you know you're you're moving your mouth in the wrong way? You know where is that signal getting disrupted, and you know we're we're really um, glossing over uh, all those levels of processing, and we're just sort of looking at post lexical selection. Um, so, in 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 practice, um, what what we try to do is we try to ignore uh, um, apraxic errors or articulation errors. We sort of, you know what, when you're scoring these things, you try to listen and try and guess what are the underlying phonemes. So, so the scoring and transcription is all done in terms of phonemes, and articulation errors are just considered noise in the system. You know, um, in the same way that maybe your speaker, you know, or your headphones are causing noise in your transcription. Right? The, um, it's, it's just noise in the, in the transmission between the phonemes and your ear and your brain. Um, which is, you know, so it's, a, it's um, which is to say we, we don't we don't really. Um, divide these things up. And there, there are differences, by the way, in terms of the presence and absence of apraxia in, in the groups from Philadelphia and 
and Columbia, the, the, the lesion masks that we looked at, that group had a lot more apraxia and uh, proboscophagia than, than perhaps you might expect in a, in a different sample. I don't know, I'm, I'm, we're still sort of figuring out what large samples of aphasic picture naming data look like, because um, it's, it's difficult to collect this data. So that, that, that in and of itself is kind of a, a new surprise. What, you know, what does two large sets of data look like from two different hospitals? I don't know, maybe, maybe I went off track there. Did that, did that answer your question? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. We, we don't seem to have any other questions from our end. Uh, <laughs> OK. OK, great. Um, well, let's see, I got it. We are on or online. I would say thank you very much. Okay, yeah, let's see. So we got one thing from online um, about uh, cross-validation. So we're, we're actually using uh, posterior prediction uh, rather than cross-validation. So we, we certainly could take some of the data out, you know, fit that, fit what's left over, estimate those parameters, and then we try and uh, try to predict that, that data that we held aside. Um, and that's not what we're doing. We're using the whole data set. Um, it's called posterior prediction, um, and statisticians argue about, you know, the various merits of that. I just went with what was easiest. So hopefully that answers that. Um, thank you very much for, for attending um, and for your questions and for your attention. Uh, my business will be put online soon and we'll have um, Kathy Price will be giving our, our, next, uh, our next talk. So I hope we're all looking forward to that and um, have a great day.